Harold Pollock. Hello there, Glenn Lowry. Welcome to the Glenn Show, Harold. Good to be talking to you again. Likewise. Yeah. So uh, what's, their, what's your official uh, designation over there at the University of Chicago? Well, I'm, uh, in, in the context of this conversation, I should say I'm the co-director of the University of Chicago Crime Lab. Spent a decent amount of time uh, worrying about ways to reduce homicide. I'm, uh, I have various other titles, but... Uh, Crime guess, Lab! Uh, Crime Lab! So yep. who's the, uh, who are the other principals involved over there? Well, the real, the real, the two people who are the central players are not me. I, I, Jens Ludwig is the director, and he's sort of a oh, I've heard of him. Dervish. Yeah, and Jens is Jens is a quite an amazing researcher. And uh-huh. Rosanna Ander is the executive director. I, I'm sort of the Joe Biden of the crime lab. I've <laughs> but I've also done randomized trials of violence prevention interventions in schools, and yeah. have been involved in a lot of uh, efforts around Chicago to. Uh, to understand what we could do to do a better job of uh, preventing homicide. So, as you might imagine, uh, my phone's been off the hook uh, yeah. after uh, the Newtown thing. And I was, uh, well, we feel um, lucky to have you at Blogging Heads, uh, your expertise to give us the uh, scientific analysis of uh, these events that seem inexplicable to the common mind. Inexplicable to mine, too. I mean, it, it's. I must say that there are... If you look for evidence-based policies, there are, uh, I think, the prevention of a mass atrocity of this sort, we have many, we really have a much smaller database than we do for many other kinds of gun homicides. And uh, it's important to remember that, uh, you know, maybe 3% of homicides in the United States look uh, look anything like this. So uh, it's a very... Uh, well, let me ask re- you, let me ask you a question, Hill, because mm-hmm. it strikes me that an event like this kind of reveals the thinness with respect, with great respect, and inadequacy of science Mm -hmm. uh, in the service of social comprehension of atrocity, of uh, tragedy, of uh, madness. You know, so so we are going to now do our studies, you see, and again, I say this with respect, I don't mean to seem to be criticizing you as an expert. Mm -hmm. I I just mean this chart is underscore, I don't know what, the limits of expertise or the inadequacy of this kind of stick figure to count of behaviors that are, you know, it seems like it's, it's, it's more suited to a novelist, uh, you know, Dostoevsky to plumb the soul kind of thing than to an, a, a, a social accountant who's going to tell me what the last three studies said about something like this. So how do you react to that? Well, it depends what the question is. I think if the question is, what's going on in the mind of a killer like this, I think what you're saying has a lot of validity. And in fact, I want to talk a little bit about about that. I think if you say, what are some policies that might reduce the incidence of these at a national level, I think we do have some information that that is helpful that comes from empirical investigation. And that's you know what else can we do? We uh, okay. Uh, you know we. I, I think. I think it is one of the things. By the way, that I find, if if we can jump into the Dostoevsky mode for a minute, and uh, oh, I'd love but, to. By the way, my favorite my favorite book is Crime and Punishment. Although I made the mistake of reading it while I was a long term doctoral student, which is just not the time you want to be reading about uh, Raskolnikov. Well, it strikes me that that may be why you were reading it because indeed <laughs> you were very much in his shoes. <laughs> I, 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 there were a few differences at the time. Hey, but, hey, yeah. I actually I knew you in those years, Harold. <laughs> you did, you did. Well, I had uh, I, I was a long term graduate student, but I had a, a, a you know wonderful wife and child so uh indeed, so was, indeed. Uh, the um but uh well actually, i actually think one of the things about raskolnikov was his desire to be the superman and and how he was so self-deceptive about what his actual motives were and one of the things i find gratifying about this latest killing is that we have not put the killer's face in lights in the way that we often do and i am convinced that that when you put, you know, there are three ways to get on the cover of Time magazine. You can find a cure for cancer, you can date Angelina Jolie, or you can go out and commit an atrocity. And it seems to me that that, that is an incentive for these people that we have to be careful of. And I'm kind of gratified in this, in this last horrific shooting that we have not, uh, the media has been, a, for a variety of reasons, has not provided the killer with that kind of, 
glorification and uh, sort of public exposure. I think every mental health professional I know believes at some gut level that it, I do not believe this is supported by by data particularly well, but I believe everyone believes this at a gut level that that publicity is a key motive for these people and the desire to enact a particular uh, scripted act of mass homicide that gets public attention in a particular way. Uh, you know that, that you know, we have to we have to do what we can to make sure that we don't okay pr live uh, that script out. So as I listen to you and, and what you say makes sense, I think. We are seeing something not only of an individual's action, but of some kind of social organism that's at work. I don't mean to go soft and, and fuzzy about responsibility. Uh, this guy did this terrible thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I won't presume to know what might have motivated him, but he did this terrible thing. But as you observe that, uh, you know, the, the event... The event gets reproduced and publicized. It becomes a social event. Uh, it gets talked about and uh, it becomes iconic. It, it then comes to represent things. It enters into the vocabulary. Uh, we remember the names of these killers. And then other would-be killers come along. They fancy themselves this or that. Uh, these social enactments figure into their own individual psychoses and get reproduced and uh, turned around and such. And, you know, I'm just thinking these events are happening with a uh, apparent frequency that the uh, that theater shooting of those people, uh, the 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 kind of uh, uh, amazing cruelty. I mean, one imagines what the moment must be that's being experienced here, uh, both for the victims and this uh, and these uh, perpetrators. In any case. In any case, I'll stop. I'm just saying it seems to me that there's a social, you know, it's like Durkheim's analysis of suicide. I don't know if you, I'm not going to pretend to be a Durkheim expert, but it, my understanding is that uh, the, the sort of sociological innovation there is to uh, understand the phenomenon of suicide, at least in part in the context of a kind of collective conscious uh, phenomenon, the individual interacting with it somehow. Anyway, yeah. I'm mumbling, I'm mumbling, so I'll stop. No, I think, by the way, the suicide dimension of gun policy is something that, I don't know that we can talk about it now in bogging heads, but by, I think the most, the greatest single opportunity to improve gun policy would be in the prevention of suicides, and that's really the connection between the proliferation of firearms and suicide is quite close. But, well, well let me add to what you were just saying, though. There, look at the way that guns are being sold and described so you know, I have I have a friend who's a uh, who's a serious hunter, and he's been shooting for years, and he's on the mailing list of the various uh, uh, you know stores that sell hunting supplies, and he's telling me uh, that he gets all of these ads for AR-15s and for various weapons that are very very explicitly sold in two ways that I th find particularly unnerving. One is that they are very militarized. The, you know, the original assault weapons ban allowed, uh, you know, it was done in a way that allowed people to get around it. Uh, and, uh, and and certainly after its repeal, there was this proliferation of weapons that are designed both in terms of their function, but also in terms of their sort of cosmetic attributes to look like something that you'd be carrying, uh, you know, while you're uh, somewhere in the wilderness in Afghanistan or whatever. You know, the, you know they have pistol grips on things and high capacity magazines and you know muzzle flash uh, things that are supposed to hide the muzzle flash and various things like that and and there's a uh, and also the way that they tie into a certain kind of masculinity there's an ad for one of these rifles where it says we're, you know re uh, you know we're going to reissue your man card you know yeah. okay now what's your point here well my point is that we are feeding that 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 there is a pro you know from a social perspective, when did it become okay for lots of people to to not not to buy guns for hunting or for sports or for self defense, but but buying military style weapons that are really uh, uh, okay so getting the pretty weapon, deep into the male psyche in a the, way the that weapon, Wayne could predict is a little disturbing. Okay, now I get that. So now the weapons uh, salespeople are marketing something, and the way marketing works is you 
try to guess what the fantasy is of the person who has the money that you're trying to get them to spend. Mm -hmm. And then you persuade the person that your product will somehow enact that fantasy. Mm -hmm. It's as if selling, uh, you know, red convertible sports cars to middle-aged men by having <laughs> adverts with beautiful young women were to be uh, criticized because it promotes adultery, which it probably does at some level. But, uh, you know, uh, that's the way you're going to get the guy to spend his money on the car. So, Well, I, I think it feeds uh, into your, your earlier analysis that, you know, capitalism is not, uh -huh. a, is not a charitable enterprise. It's something that whatever desires are out there, there's going to be a group of people who are going to figure out how, how they can uh, profit by, by feeding off of those desires. And in many cases, it... Uh, these markets operate in a way that undermines larger communal values or creates specific dangers that the market itself is not going to address. You know, certainly, I mean, that's also, of course, the way we sell cigarettes and the way we sell lots of other things. And, Did you and, read Michael Sandel's book? I have not read Michael Sandel's book. I, I've seen him uh, talk about the book, which, uh, which perhaps in many blogging heads contexts might be enough, but, uh, but not, <laughs> not on your show. Uh, well, I, I admit not to having read it, although I did a little bit more. I read an essay of his that, that developed the argument of the book. But, I mean, commodification, is, I mean, I, I think the idea yeah. that, I mean, well, let's talk about Daniel Bell if you want to go back. I mean, the cultural contradictions of capitalism, I think that there is a real, uh, there's a lot to that argument. And, uh, you know, we, we have a market society that works very well because we have a foundation of norms that the market itself often tends to undermine. And, I got uh, that point. I think that's right. But I'd add something to that. I'd, I'd say that um, there's a spiritual dimension somehow mm -hmm. uh, involved as well. That um, I mean, what you value is not itself, you know, kind of rationally arrived at. There's, there's, there's a, um, I don't know, a pre-commitment somehow that um, I'm not sure exactly what the theory is here, but. I don't think it's all about. Uh, uh, I don't think it's all about reason. Well, and but, I, I think the way that the commercial environment uh, shapes our values and and uh, often presents a very toxic moral and cultural normative environment for young, particularly for young men. I think it's a really I mean, deep. No, issue. that's right. I just realized what I want to say. I mean, freedom. Freedom is a kind of vacuous thing unless you give it some content. I mean, just to celebrate freedom as such, it seems to me that that could be critiqued at some level. I mean, uh, that's like a meta valuation. I mean, freedom to do what? You know, I mean, uh, that is really the question. And, uh, you know, a set of procedures doesn't give me an answer to that question. It doesn't have enough content uh, to give me an answer to the question of, you know, what's the good life? What should I do? So, um, I mean, people want to be free to carry these guns, but, uh, you know, in the end, we're <laughs> the road rage, we're killing each other, we're, you know. Um, it, it, one of the things that, yeah, and there's a fundamental lack of the, the need for balance there. That So I, well, if you talk to some people who, who say, you know, I, I like to hunt or I like to target shoot with an AR-15, and I think, I, and there's some reasons why people want to do that. Uh, you know that are that are you know legitimate reasons, but there's but there's often a lack of a sense. Well, we have to balance this. You know, we we're learning that there's a real public safety cost to that, and maybe maybe target practice can't be quite as fun as uh, as it would otherwise be because there's some segment of people who are going to use these weapons. Uh, it seems to me like a high capac high capacity magazines. Uh, you know, do I think it's going to dramatically reduce homicides in America by limiting uh military no. style you know it's not going to but it will reduce some and the in you know and, and and it seems to me that there's a, there's such a fundamental unreasonableness to the objections to uh in, in in this sort of absolutist support for the second amendment that either comes from a selfishness or it comes from this idea that i need to be you know the armed citizen as the as the check on the power of the state you know oh, no exactly i think that's a really important point i mean um I don't think it has anything to do with causality. I mean, the, how we go on this question or how we ought to go on this question. Uh, if you limit the magazines, then you will reduce the number of fatalities by X. I mean, I think given that the ridiculousness of the arguments on behalf of having this kind of weaponry, 
citizens need to be armed over and against the state. I mean, you know, let's interrogate that idea for a minute. Uh, when you have an event like this, it just makes sense to, uh, uh, to uh, you know, want to express your revulsion and your, your, your concern, even if you couldn't demonstrate with statistics that there was a causal connection between limiting these magazines and uh, these kind of events taking place. By the way, I, I just I agree with that. I would just mention one uh, one of the things that I did a couple of years ago is I went through uh, 200 consecutive, uh, basically medical examiner and autopsy reports of, of homicides in Chicago to try to understand you know wh what were some of the patterns. Uh, and by the way, almost none of them were committed with uh, anything that would be described even in some loose way as an assault weapon. Most of them were where with sort of off-the-shelf uh, semi-automatic pistols were sort of the typical gun. Uh, one of the striking things about these assault weapons is even the, uh, even the criminals don't need them. You know, there's, you know, if, if, if you know, the drug gangs of Chicago want to kill somebody, you know, they walk up to them and they shoot them. And, uh, or they shoot, you know, I mean, there's a lot of problems with uh, gun violence in Chicago, but, you know, they're not, you know, the professional criminals are not looking to shoot the 20 people that are standing next to the guy that they're trying to shoot. And, uh, and it's really um, sort of the, the, the lack of utility of these weapons for, for anything other than, uh, uh, you know, some very serious, uh, uh, you know, e either, either mass homicide or, uh, you know, some other uh, essentially military uses of these weapons, uh, you know, it's really striking. You know, it's, uh, you know, even the mafia doesn't really want them. They actually have, they, they will have these weapons. Uh, for instance, in the, in the strong house where they have the money and the drugs, they'll often have some pretty high-powered weapons, but they never, uh, like when the police raid one of these houses, they never you try to use those weapons against the police. <laughs> so if you the police, you better remember the police are actually scared because they know that some of these gangs have these weapons, but the gangs have no desire to use these weapons to really control no, the it, state. It's like you're describing mutually assured destruction or something like that. You know? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, uh, I mean, it is a problem, especially because these weapons also penetrate the the police. You know, the bulletproof vest. They'll. Uh, but 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 let me ask you this. I mean, do, do you agree with me that it is a pernicious uh, idea that individuals uh, ought to be armed uh, over and against the depredations of the state. That is, mm -hmm. that in a country of 300 plus million people, uh, where you have a government with a, uh, what are they spending, a trillion dollars a year or something close to that at the Pentagon? Um, what, 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 it's only if you count the off budget I, defense spending, I think, when you get up to that. <laughs> I think the official spending is this market. I mean, what is the conception of political conflict, dispute, or action in which armament in the homes of individuals is relevant yeah. to the resolution of the question of the powers exerted by the federal or state government over and against individual persons? Well, I mean, I, I just want to know what the – is it always going to be some kind of shootout of some uh, loon who's gone off to some compound somewhere and decides he doesn't want to have a warrant – served on him? I mean, because this just sounds like madness to me. Well, but, you know, politics. it's very, it, it, it strikes me as madness as well, although it's also something that has very deep historical resonance in American history from, in, in lots of different ways. Uh, you know, there were, there was, a, you know, for instance, African Americans in the South, there's a, there's a dimension of people who support the Second Amendment because they point to the reality that African Americans could not, uh, could not count on the state to defend them. And therefore, uh, you know, owning weapons for individual protection, you know, was was a real thing. And uh, you know, now of course the problem the problem with that was that after the Union troops left the South, you know, in Reconstruction, the local whites, you know, just had such an overwhelming preponderance of military force that it was it was hard for the African American farmers in South Carolina or wherever to actually defend themselves. Uh, but uh, I mean, but there's lots of different strands that go deep in American history. Even though I, you know, I wish that we had a different historical narrative that was compelling to people. But uh, but it's there. But I'll give you another way that it strikes me as very pernicious. There's nothing that's more frightening than the idea that someone is going to try to break into your home and kill you. And you know, if, if Wayne Lapierre today talked about someone smashing into your, you know, breaking your windows at three o'clock in the morning. Wouldn't you want to have a gun at that moment? So, yeah. so I asked the Chicago Police Department to look at all of the homicides in Chicago that uh, that 
that had a motive of burglary. And I mean, and I looked around the country at uh, some, you know, some reports on on burglary homicides. So in Chicago in 2011, there was one homicide that listed the motive as burglary. There were another 17 where there were domestic altercations, and it might have been, you know, a non-resident spouse who had come in. And I don't know that we actually got all of the possible cases. Around the country, there's about 100 burglary homicides a year. So, uh, you know, this is a very, very rare crime. It's very... Sp- Out of how many homicides? So, uh, so, 30, so, well, in a given year in gun homicides in the United States, it's a little less than 9,000. Uh, okay. But there's 18,000 gun suicides. And so, uh, you know, the reality is if you, bring a, if you bring a gun into your house because you're worried about the threat of a, of a stranger, you know, of an intruding stranger that you need to repel with a gun, you know, you're just so much more likely to have that gun. If that gun ever causes, if that gun is ever fired in anger, it's yeah. so much more likely to be part of some sort of a tragedy than it is that you're actually repelling someone from your home. Uh, and, and it is... Uh, you know, I, I just think that, uh, uh, you know, well, particularly yeah. with the suicide issue, you just don't, it's just something that, that is, it's a part of our culture that has created so many problems. It's here to stay. Yep. Anything else to say thing. about, uh, oh, I will say, I do, I am somewhat well, optimistic. There's one other point I was going to make on guns, but you were going to say something else. No, I was going to ask you what the clinical trials in which you've engaged teach you that's relevant to policies that might make tragedies like what happened in Newtown, Connecticut, less likely to occur? I actually think I have personally learned relatively little about what could help with these kinds of tragedies, because these tragedies are so unrepresentative of the great, great majority of homicides. And in fact, I think these are useful to, to... generate public attention on the issue of gun safety, which I think is we need to be focused on. All of the things that I've learned that might be valuable are things that would prevent other types of gun homicides. They would. I think there's a lot we can do to help young people deal with potentially lethal conflicts better, which is how we reduced violence in the studies that I was involved in. And I think there's a lot we can do to disrupt illegal gun markets so that 17 and 18-year-olds are less likely to have guns, uh, you know, when they're ready to just you know to resolve a 17 or 18 year dispute with some other guy but i must say that anyone who claims that they have a really powerful way to prevent an atrocity like the newtown thing i think is uh you know they're not speaking from evidence that i'm familiar with you know i I support a better assault weapons ban i think we're actually going to get something that's going to be useful but i don't think that uh uh, I think that the existing evidence base is very thin on these ma- on preventing these uh, these mass atrocities. Uh, so, so okay. So let's uh, let's move mm-hmm. on to the other topics we were talking about. Uh, and one thing I know that you wanted to reflect on after the election is your experience during the campaign and interacting with people who didn't share your political views necessarily. Mm-hmm and how much you learned from those exchanges. So why don't you talk about that for a little bit? So, you know, it's a funny thing. This election was actually about big stuff. It was about the future of social insurance in America. It was about inclusion in matters of gay rights and other big things. I think this was an election that was about big issues. The actual conversation and policy debate within the election was, I thought, quite impoverished. And... You know, I was going to say, I didn't think that's what the election was about at all. I thought the election was about uh, Bain Capital and uh, whatever the attack on uh, Obama from the other side was. But, uh, you know, I thought it was an ad hominem election about uh, which one of these people was trustworthy or something like well, that. Well, I think that there, were, there, there are several conversations that go on in an election. There's the rhetoric. Uh, and I think strategically, for example, Mitt Romney really had very little incentive to actually present a substantive program with real details that would really where the numbers would really add up and he didn't he offered vaporware uh and you know if you look at almost any of the proposals that romney had they just they didn't add up and you just couldn't even figure out what in many ways what they actually were uh the only thing that he offered that was concrete was we're going to cut medicaid and we're going to cut some of the programs aimed at poor people and he, he was he was he was pretty specific about that but he actually tried to disown the Republican platform, you know, he, he ran away from any kind of specific 
because he wanted Obama to be the issue. And I actually think strategically that made a certain amount of sense, but it made it kind of difficult to have a real policy conversation. In fact, a lot of liberals were sending me emails saying, could you blog about how horrible the Romney plan on Medicare is or something like that? And I would say, I'd love to do that, but I, I don't know how to fairly criticize this thing because it's so amorphous. Uh, yeah. The... Um, uh, but I think, but, but okay. So, so the election wasn't about so issues. The, but so, so well, I think what was what was about issues but but it, was it wasn't, but it yeah, was. I mean, well, I mean, we knew that if Romney won, it would have been the repeal of health reform. It would have been a Ryan budget. It would have been a series of things that had that really were big issues. And I think things like the forty-seven percent remark actually did, in a in an interesting way, crystallize public uh, response. Uh, that was that really was about the substance, but not triggered by any specific rhetoric that engaged that substance. Uh, but anyway, uh, what, what I, but I didn't learn anything about policy listening to the candidates. What I really did learn something about was just going door to door and talking to people. And I think, by the way, that that, that was a really valuable effort. Uh, I think that in many ways the Obama ground game won the election for the president. Unfortunately, those of us that went out to do that work in many ways, we were the least qualified people to really persuade folks because we were, you know, you go to someone's door and they say, I'm undecided. And we say, how can you be undecided? You know, uh, and you want to you want to debate that person at their door, uh, which is, of course, the worst possible strategy to actually change someone's mind, really. Uh, but what I found was when I really sat back and said, well, tell me what you're ambivalent about. And, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, you know, why is it that you're not, convinced by Romney or convinced by Obama. And I and I really did get a bunch of both interesting responses and responses where I could say, you know, I really understand where you're coming from in that. And you know, in order to in order to be an effective persuader and communicator and organizer, you have to actually be willing to take seriously why somebody might disagree with you and and see where in that worldview there might be some common ground. Some, some Harold, I have to tell you, I've known that for a long time. Uh, well, you know, it's, I, I didn't say it was original, but I think it's important. <coughs> and I think that the political, the rhetoric of a campaign season really drives that insight out of your mind because you're so angry and motivated that it's hard it's hard to keep in your mind at the same time, hey, not everybody's going to feel that way. And, uh, I mean, it was interesting talking to you because you were diffident so, about the president in a way that I don't yeah. share, but I think I learned from. And... Uh, uh, and it's, uh, I'm sorry, you were going to say something else. Yeah, I think it slips my mind now exactly what I was going to say. I mean, I, I guess I was going to say I don't care as much about politics or that I don't feel that I, maybe a cynicism has crept over me such that, and that may account to some degree for my diffidence toward uh, President Obama, that... Um, you know, I don't really see this as the forces of darkness and light uh, as, you know, some kind of epic struggle to advance some high moral purpose as, uh, as you know, holding back the, the, the Mongols who would otherwise overrun us and take us to some... But I see us as muddling through. I mean, I see, I see the world populated by agricultural price support policies. Um, Americans with disability regulations, um, uh, your health care uh, uh, magnum mm -hmm. opus, uh, and things of this kind, and K Street lobbyists, uh, a lot of um, rent seeking, um, a whole lot of symbolic smearing, Madison Avenue image shaping, news cycle writing. Uh, you know, I'm a cynic, and, and so I can't imbue the political action with this kind of nobility and this sense of, you know, so I, I don't know. I, I think I made you know, my I, point. I, 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 my response to that is that, I'm sorry, I'll let you finish your sentence. No, 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 it's all right. So yeah, I would say that, that there both things are happening. In some ways, the smallness of the day-to-day -day tactical stuff that is the work of practical politics can obscure the large issues at stake. In, in some way, that was clearly in some ways what the movie Lincoln was about. Where I was watching Lincoln, and I was thinking, like, he's going to come out with the public option by the time we're done with this, the way that it was framed. I mean, it seemed it was very explicit that it was, you know, you could have, you know, I was, 
watching them try to get to 60 votes to pass health reform and all the little uh, things that you have to do, the gravy that you have to give to Ben Nelson or whatever it is. Yeah, you know, yeah, I remember. I think that, I think Hirsch, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think that, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Kushner remembered it as well. And that, uh, and I think both things are happening, you know, that if you want to, uh, there is the price support dimension, there's the, there's the rent-seeking aspects of politics, and there's also the, the ways that we really have enlarged our politics in the past several years. When I look at something like the DREAM Act or uh, uh, the recognition of same-sex marriage, that's big stuff. That's that's uh, now it's true that it's big stuff that's done within the you know that's happening within the, the thrust and parry of American politics. So you know if if, if Latinos were not a key constituency in uh, uh, you know there's clearly them playing such an important role in uh, electoral politics, you wouldn't have seen the Dream Act play out as it's playing out. Uh, but uh, uh, but you know it's big stuff. I don't. I, no, no. Hold on a minute. Hold on. Now tell me. I, I'm, I'm going to be a contrarian here to okay. some degree. Let's take the Dream Act and let's take. And by Dream Act, I mean a whole issue. panoply of. Uh, I, I should say, I mean. Yeah. yeah. So do I, mm -hmm. Carol. So do so do I. I mean a whole panoply of things. I mean a certain. Let me call it progressive vision about immigration policy. Okay. So now we're moving history forward because the pendulum is swinging because this once was a country that was like that and now it's going to be a country that's like this. Mm -hmm. Now with, I don't know, 12 million or so undocumented or illegal uh, workers and the aliens in the country with um, a uh, border that's not uh, completely under control and with deeply... Uh, entrenched, uh, you know, political conflict around this issue, animating uh, politics uh, on both sides of the aisle in a dozen states. What is the progressive vision? What What, what is the, you know, um, if I were to make an analogy, all right, the civil rights movement, I know what the thing was we were trying to do. We were trying to overthrow Jim Crow and make equal citizens out of people who were not, okay, who happened to be the descendants of slaves. What's the comparable, progressive, move the ball forward vision? It is not at all clear to me that it's a good thing. Let me just be as pointed about this as I can possibly be, that the Latino, Hispanic minority have as much influence over the formulation of immigration policy through our politics as they do. I don't necessarily see that. I need to be persuaded. I'm open-minded about it as moving us toward being a just and righteous country. It's arguable. Well, I, I think that there's a couple of things there that I would untangle. I think what is an issue of social justice is we have a group of millions of people who are here who we have actually uh, invited, solicited. You know, we've invited them by, by soliciting their labor who've been here in many cases for decades and who are for all practical purposes Americans in their day-to-day -day life. Uh, and yet, we, uh, they, you know, their legal status is, uh, you know, is problematic. When they, you know, please come and shingle my roof, but if you fall off that roof, please don't use my health care system. Uh, you, have, uh, you have people like in Little Village. I was, I was involved with a safety initiative in Little Village, which is, which is a tremendous, uh, it's sometimes called the, the Mexican capital of the Midwest, uh, a tremendous uh, neighborhood in Chicago. Uh, and so we, we, they were doing a safety uh, initiative because kids were getting, bothered, you know, were getting assaulted on the way home from school. So they asked for parent volunteers. So parents show up and they say, yeah, I'm going to stand out there and protect kids who are walking home. But it turned out it was a city thing, and so someone said, well, there, unfortunately, there's a background check. And, uh, and all of these moms and dads sort of start to melt away because they can't pass the background check. And I'm thinking, oh, here are these people. They're standing here. They've been living here for a long time. Their kids are American citizens in many cases. They're contributing yeah. to the community. We're benefiting from their presence here. Uh, and And... You know, that is so fundamentally unjust. Now, I do think there's a difference between those people 
I mean, excuse me, excuse me here. What I is think unjust? What's unjust is that is that we have, uh, you know, within the American economy, the American you know employers and consumers uh, and coworkers have benefited from the labor of uh, of these men and women. We have we have pretended to enforce our immigration laws. You know, you know, and it's clear that if you don't know, say the large farming, the large agricultural concerns in the Southwest and meatpacking firms in Iowa and Georgia and so on, you know, they have been quite happy to have the low wage labor that these immigrants have been supplying. Well, well, hold on, hold on. You don't. You shouldn't. Excuse me. You shouldn't just single out the firms because the firms yeah. have customers, and the customers are benefiting from these products being offered Absolutely. at a lower price because of this labor. So it's not as if. So, okay, so hey, that broadens, I, I think that broadens make clear the that the face of, of this the, of those of us who have benefited. Okay. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, so the injustice is the fact that people don't have status, and yet they're contributing to the common okay. wheel. That's and, the and and there's the reality that they're not going anywhere, and you know we have to somehow deal with this problem. But that's not an injustice. I just want to be clear on what the normative map is. I'm trying to understand what's righteous or good, and and, this. and the idea that people are not being treated. Right, because they don't have status, even though they're making a contribution to the economy. And I just want to say, I don't find that persuasive. I mean, again, with respect and not necessarily against the <laughs> against the immigrant, but just saying people made a choice, okay, except for the children who were born here, okay, but if they're mm -hmm. born here or who are brought here, I'm sorry, yeah. you know what I mean, who were brought here uh, uh, without status, by and large, people have made a choice. Moreover, people are themselves benefiting. Okay, so it's not as if there's not a quid pro quo. So I'm still not clear if there are laws and people are in violation of the law, then what is unjust about well, that? By, by the way, is I, that there's a couple things about that. Well, one is, of course, the children are a major issue. Uh, the, the, uh, yeah. uh, there's, a, there's a famous quote, I forget who said it, maybe it was Peter Schneider in Germany. We said, we, we, asked, we asked for laborers and they sent us men. I mean, there's this way that we have. It does seem to me when you say they violated the law, they have violated the law on the books. They have not violated. I mean, there's clearly been an implicit uh, agreement in many, uh, uh, in many ways, uh, in public policy that has, uh, you know, that has, that has not enforced that law. In fact, I think in some ways our incompetent enforcement of immigration law is the compromise that we've reached on immigration policy. If we actually had, suppose we had a beautiful e-verify system tomorrow, and we could really identify everyone who's in the United States illegally in a very efficient way, I think that the human and economic consequences of that would be so catastrophic that we would all sort of put it in the drawer and pretend that we didn't have it. Uh, and everyone involved in this debate knows the hypocrisy of it. Uh, and Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute, Harold. Excuse me. Just let me let me, because I'm troubled by this argument that you're making. Uh, I'm not unsympathetic to it, but but let me see because it must have a limit. Because a person could argue that uh, in a similar way, drug transactions. Okay, so these are illegal transactions, and there are tons of people mm -hmm. in prison for them. But but think about it. The widespread use of illegal drugs creates a market which then draws forth this chain of supply mm -hmm. and transaction and all of that, which then lead to people yep. being locked up. But it's your casual user somewhere who's snorting a little cocaine or smoking a little marijuana or whatever it might be, who in the millions and tens of millions draws into existence mm -hmm. this market. So by the logic that I understand you to be applying in this case, which I'm questioning, it would appear that there's injustice in confining people for violating the drug laws in virtue of the fact that they're only induced to do so by the hedonism and uh, the desire for illicit transactions of the vast majority or at least a very large plurality I'm not sure you're critiquing my immigration argument or, or noting its broader application in another domain. <laughs> uh, it seems to me that... By the way, I do draw some lines. I, I actually find it very strange that we... It's called reductio ad absurdum. Well, I'm, I, I'm, 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 uh, you'll, you'll have to explain that to me in another <laughs> blogging hands. The, the, uh, uh, okay. the, the, um, I, I, by the way, what I do find puzzling is birthright citizenship. 
as a concept. I think the idea that I, I have no connection to American society, but I can, but I can come yeah. over the border into San Diego and give birth to a child who then becomes an American citizen. I actually think that's quite paradoxical. I, I, I find it, I find it counterintuitive that a young man who's gone to high school, who's lived in Chicago for his entire life, and who's now 18 and is undocumented, but who's who's an American by any common sense definition of his everyday life. That, that he has fewer legal rights than an infant who was born four days ago in a hospital in San Diego who, whose family has no connection to the United States other than the location of his birth. Uh, th that strikes me. I don't know what I would, I don't know that what I would do, uh, whether I would repeal birthright citizenship, but I, I actually find that uh, more anomalous than the idea that we have to do something to regularize the citizenship of that 18 year old who's who speaks English as a first language and who uh, and who is undocumented by sort of particularity of his family circumstance. Yeah. That, I so, uh, that. but anyway, but I do think the larger point was there was a lot going on that was very large in the election, and this was one immigration was one okay. same sex marriage, and one of the things that I find some sympathy for at a human level, and I'm I'm totally in favor of every liberal thing uh, that I on the list that you might identify uh, I have some sympathy with people who just say wow it's hard for me to keep up as a person with the pace of this change and I talk to a lot of older people uh, and you know I could just see they were like I was just raised in a country that seems to be you know the bedrock seems to be moving under my feet and I, I kind of can't keep up with that and I, I can understand how people can can feel rather bewildered by the all of a sudden there's president barack hussein obama we have you know gay people being married we have uh and all and oh okay so these people these people are not just bigots then uh, or homophobes or racist um or they they're not just to be swept to the side with the back of our hands as the uh, march forward uh, to history through history i i think it would be a big mistake to treat people in that way to, to dismiss people in that way, even if I wish we had another word for homophobia and racist and so on, that was that what that conveyed some element that said, yeah, you have some values and some assumptions and some policy preferences that that have to be defeated or rejected, but I don't reject you as a person because I can understand how you came to hold those, and there's a lot. There's a lot of your values that I actually admire and, and embrace, even if I disagree with you about some of these issues. I think it's really important for liberals to be to be open and embracing with people as they're trying to digest social change. Okay, well, I'll know that that's true when I see a liberal change her mind about something substantive because they pause to listen to somebody over 50 for a minute uh, and thought again about whether or not their latter day values were altogether nice, new, shiny. Well, there's and two issues there. One is, do I change my own policy preferences? <laughs> the other is, how do I relate to you as a person, and what kind of conclusions do I draw about you? Okay, so here's what I'm asking you. Here's what I'm asking. I hear you. I, I make that distinction. How do you know you're right, though? Please don't condescend to me. I'm going to put myself in the position of one of these people who's having a little trouble with the pace of change, even though I'm an mm -hmm. African American. Even though I'm an intellectual, I'm an academic, and even though I'm a liberal of some stripe or another, uh, let me just say I'm struggling with some of the uh, rapidity of the changes in a way. I sometimes wonder if I want my country back, whatever that mm -hmm. country used to be uh, from back when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s and stuff like that. So um, uh, how do you know you're right, I mean, uh, about all of these different things? And... And uh, uh, is it a condescension? Are you simply saying to this person, look, I know you're benighted, but I understand? Uh, or are you actually listening to this person in a way that says, perhaps, maybe there's some kernel of wisdom tucked away somewhere in your nostalgia. Maybe everything about our traditions is not uh, necessarily uh, shop-worn and uh, an impediment to enlightenment. Uh, you know, maybe I don't necessarily have to, uh, you know, rewrite the entire uh, book of life. Maybe I can continue on with a few of the chapters, even though they don't quite 
uh, have that modern sound to them, something like that. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm going to sound like a has been if I keep up. Well, with this you know, thing. it's a little. I, I guess I go. <laughs> it's a little bit of both perspectives. I think it's important to stand up for liberal values and to say, you know, an issue like same-sex marriage that, uh, you know, I I think it's something that that we have to do in public policy, and and uh, we can be respectful in our disagreement. But uh, but but I'm. Well, but let me we, tell you this. Let me tell you this. Mm-hmm. I gotta tell you this. Mm-hmm. I gotta tell you this. You know, so my son is gay. My son Glenn mm-hmm. uh, the second, uh, who has been on Blocking Heads and will be on again, is a gay man. And my father is uh, 80, 83, 84. Uh, my father will be mm-hmm. eighty four. He's eighty three years old. Okay. So now, now, when I tried to tell my father that my son was gay, he basically told me to shut up. And every time it's come up since, it's been a 90-second conversation. Okay? Now, what am I supposed to do with that? Um, you know, well, you part know of it is, I, I, that's a hard one. <laughs> Not like you know the answer, but maybe well, you Well, you know, I, <laughs> I guess part of it is, I think that, and maybe this, maybe this is just a matter of sort of how people relate to each other. I, uh, I would say, first of all, you know, we're going to, Dad, we're going to disagree about this. Uh, for lots of reasons, oh, we're going to, um, we know we're going to disagree about this. We still love each other, and we still have an appreciation of the depth of, of where our disagreements are coming from. And, you know, I have a son that I have to embrace who is, who is an admirable man in, in the ways that really count. And he's gay, and that's a tough one. Uh, for the tradition that we're in. Uh, and I, you know, I, I have to embrace him and his equal rights and equal dignity. Uh, but I can but I can do that in a way that doesn't go out of its way to, to denigrate everything about our tradition. And there are things about our tradition that I desperately want to keep. And by the way, I'm confident that a lot of people like your dad are going to come around uh, on some of these issues. I think especially if you treat people respectfully and you say, well, what is it about... Uh, there are some people who say, I just think homosexuality is intrinsically wrong, and they stop there. Most people, you know, when they see someone in their family that they come to respect who's gay, it changes, it changes their perspective, and it will change their perspective with less pain and more quickly if we give people a little bit of space to do that in their own way. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who, uh, who have to go through a journey on this issue. Uh, I must say one of the things that I like about the developmental disability issue, as I've mentioned on blogging heads before, is the people who are often doing the most good on that issue are religious people who, who, have, who feel an, a special commitment to the dignity of every person it comes from their religious values. Uh, I think you once told me that the way that the Christian right rejected the kind of mentality of the bell curve because there was this belief that God isn't finished with you when he deals you your gen- genetic hand. And I, I find that, I find that so sad, moving huh? because that's been my human experience. You know, I go out and I sell Tootsie Rolls to raise money for the developmentally disabled with people from the Knights of Columbus. And, you know, and I don't, I don't go out of my way to tell them, hey, I'm a Jewish atheist who's liberal on every issue. Uh, you know, we, we, you know, we do the work that we're there to do and that we both value for our own reasons. And we need to have more of those kinds of bridging experiences where we can learn from each other. Maybe it's not on the gay issue that you're going to learn from your dad and have, a, have that relationship. You know, maybe it's uh, other things. Uh, but I think what would be bad would be if you said, if you're wrong on this issue, then you're a bad person that I don't want to talk to, or I'm going to give up on the prospect of convincing you about the things that I think are important because I so deeply disagree with you about this one issue. I don't know if that that's sort of my reaction. Yeah, it sounds like good advice, and uh, I haven't I haven't acted in any way that's uh, that contravenes you know the wisdom in what you've just said. It, it makes makes sense to me. I'll, I'll just add. I mean, it's poignant. Because, of course, my father and my son, you know, I mean, it's not like we spend that much time together. He lives in a retirement mm-hmm. community in Florida. We get down there, but not all that often. He doesn't travel that much. But uh, when Glenn and he and I are together, of course, there's a loving and uh, joyous great. Um, atmosphere. 
But we don't talk about Glenn's life. There's just a big fenced off yeah. area there. And well, you know, Glenn's uh, one day he and his partner are probably going to want to marry. Yeah. You know, I mean, it would be a natural progression, and he's certainly given me that indication. And uh, you know, he's <laughs> yeah, he's yeah. Maybe maybe, maybe blogging heads is not the to work out uh, <laughs> you know, the, the intricacies of anyone's romantic yeah. life. Um, well, well, I see what you're. I, I, no, I, I mean, um, no, Glenn, 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 and I have been on mm -hmm. Blogging Heads talking yes. about his sexuality. So it's not as if that's not new to you know that's news to the audience. But I'll stop because I don't want to embarrass my son. He can speak for himself. I I, I just want to say, yeah, there's a lot of undeveloped uh, dimension to the yeah. regeneration relationship here that is foreclosed. Because of this. By the way, yeah, I, I, I just want to interject so one thing. My dad is 83, and and, uh, uh -huh. and he's probably going to be watching this at some point. And I want to say how what a privilege it is. Well, I have a very close relationship with my dad that he uh, ha is uh, uh, they were he's had an evolution in his political values in a lot of ways, but he is so uh, uh, open in so many ways uh that 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 uh uh you know that i admire uh, uh and we and we haven't had to, we haven't had this kind of painful issue because uh, i i uh you know i just feel he's ahead of me on a lot of social values that i admire so uh so i just thought i would note that i feel privileged uh the, you know in that uh in that dimension but uh but i'm sorry go ahead I, that was a tangent to you no, that, that's sweet, Harold. I'm glad you put that in there. Uh, let's. Uh, why don't we close this out? Um, yeah. We're at uh, 50 minutes. Uh, did uh, I don't? Can, can we have another conversation about? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll what they are is appetite that I'm. I'm terrified about health reform and uh, and. Well, I think that's worth exploring. I really. Uh, no, that that, that, that could be a long sure. conversation, but uh, it was. Uh, it was great yeah. to talk to you, and uh, I hope that we uh, uh, we actually followed our agenda somewhat closer than we often do. So I feel we were successful in that uh, in that way. Uh, and we didn't fight, Harold. Now that the election is, you over. know, I feel weight has been <laughs> lifted. It's it's amazing. I did find that I was getting very angry. Me I, too. I did find I was getting so angry during the election that I stopped listening and learning pretty early in the game, and I felt I could wow. feel it in myself. That I was that I was not intellectually creative. That that I was uh, you know that I was I felt I was doing something important by doing all the political work that I was doing. But uh, I I feel like uh, I'm happy it's over uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, and uh, now of course we have this stupid fiscal cliff stuff, and uh, it, it's uh, I'm telling you, it's you, you can't. Uh, I feel it was one of the most important things that I ever did, but I also feel like it was something that limited me in some important ways. And in fact, one of the, another blogging heads we might have sometime is how one can be both partisan and and intellectually honest and and open at the same time, which I think is a really oh. Or weather, weather, weather that's one. precisely <laughs> right. And uh, we, the uh, uh, yeah. I, so anyway, that's we have well, lots of topics for future conversation. Fortunately, the presidential election is only every four years, so you have a window of recovery. Yeah, I'm deciding whether or not to throw my own hat in the ring uh, for the next time around. I'll announce that on the blog. <laughs> uh, best wishes of the season to Likewise. you and your family, Likewise. Harold. So, Thanks for doing okay. it. We'll okay, so I'm going to stop recording. Bye-bye.